Welcome to the Real Advisor Podcast, T-R-A-P, TRAP. Please follow us and join in the conversation on Twitter at Advisor Podcast, where you can suggest ideas and themes you'd like the TRAP team to discuss. Also remember to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave a six out of five star review on iTunes. Doing all this really, really helps us, which means we can do more to help you. Now let's head over to the studio for the latest pile of trap. Yes, indeed. Welcome back, dear Trappist, to episode five of the Real Advisor podcast, T-R-A-P. My name is Nick Lincoln. Joining me in the studio of Doom as ever are the three other horsemen of the apocalypse, Carl Widger, Alan Smith and Andy Hart. We have a packed show today, so let's start unpacking it straight away. I just want to lead off with the passing of Ian Taylor last week. Visionary is an overused word, but I think he really does fall into that category, did fall into that category uh, with, a, with a small band of cohorts in the late 1990s. He had this idea of a platform where there was no commission, no trail. The advisor and the client set the agenda, and he was coming from another world with that idea back then. Anyway, he pursued it and pursued it, pursued it. Today, Transac is almost a synonym for, for what a platform is. And he passed away at the age of 58. Gregarious guy, really clever guy. And one of those people that we couldn't afford to lose because he could he'd speak his mind and he didn't care who he was telling. Um, and, we, and we need more of those people in, in, in the world. And uh, so his passing... Um, is, is, a, is, a, is a big thing. So I hope his family is, uh, is coping as best they can. Alan, you have a, a recollection just, of Ian Taylor. Yeah, just, just a quick one. We, we were, unlike some of you guys, quite late to the Transact party. We were quite early adopters of a platform, but quite late to Transact. And only a couple of years ago, um, we thought we need, to, we need to engage with Transact. And I just, I'd simply sent an email to their sales team, as you would do, you know, can we connect? Can we have a conversation about perhaps considering using Transact as a platform? And I'd say within about half an hour, I get a reply to my email from Ian Taylor, who I'd never met before. And his office is based close to ours in the city. And the, and the email said, fancy a pint, question mark. <laughs> it's a humble brag. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, great. So uh, my uh, colleague and I just went for a beer with him. And just and he was just so refreshing. I just thought in comparison with, and you know, this is a listed business. And it was the CEO of the organization in comparison with experiences we probably all have with trying to deal with anyone senior in larger organizations. So good, so refreshing. And, um, you know, we got on like a house on fire. We did have more than uh, one pint, um, as is traditional, I believe, with Ian, what I began to learn. And um, fantastic character. And everything you say is absolutely spot on, uh, Nick. Um, very, very sad loss to the profession, to the industry, and, of course, to his family and our condolences to them. Yeah, yeah. I think you can often judge a person by what's said, after them, said about them when they're gone. And you think that our, our friend and you know, platform superstar, uh, David Ferguson, the people like this are just gushing over this guy. I and mean, they, they kind of looked up to him and, and these are people of stature in their own right. So um, yeah, rest in peace, Ian Taylor. So myself just, and um, young Mr. Hart, go on, Andy. Just a quick story on Ian. Um, yeah, obviously he set up Transact on a, a tiny street just off uh, off a roundabout in, uh, in Old Street, uh, Singer Street, I believe it was called. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing him talk in um, St. Albans at one of the hotels and he was saying, basically, we get the computers to do, I think 98% of the, simple tasks that can be done by computers but we still have that two percent element that can be done by humans and that's that's what basically separated transact from the rest they still had that human element to get things right um, but obviously yeah automated a, a shed load um yeah i think didn't, didn't know him personally um but i um i saw him a few times but yeah a huge huge loss to this mighty profession yeah sorry over to you nick thanks Adam, no worries um so myself and mr hart have um <laughs> been to south africa <laughs> and conquered South Africa for uh, Andy's Humans Under Management South Africa leg. And it was seven or eight days. It was great fun. We didn't do any of the tourist stuff before anybody asks. Uh, <laughs> we saw a lot of restaurants and bars. The Hum uh, Cape Town day was great. Uh, I'd like to thank Pierre. I'd like to thank Rob and um, Dirk, Lunch Club Dirk. Um, Donny, the, the, the reception they gave us was so warm and so lovely. Uh, it was my first time there. I think second time for you, Andy, and uh, it was very, very, very good. And uh, thank you, Andy, for giving me the opportunity to um, to go there and speak. We spoke uh, a couple of events, sort of top at the start of the, 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 the our journey there, and at the end, and I think we went down reasonably well. We didn't didn't 
cause any diplomatic incidents, uh, as far as I'm aware. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was all good. Uh, even, even, even giving money to the cleaners at Cape Town Airport to go back through security and buy us sleeping tablets, which could have all gone horribly wrong. Yeah, that sort of midnight express vibe to the whole thing. Um, yeah, and, was- and myself and Alan would like to thank you both for documenting every single moment of every day on our WhatsApp group. That was amazing. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Just a couple of videos. What's, uh, what what goes videos. on in Cape Town stays in Cape Town, right, guys? <clears throat> yeah, no, no, we, was- we, we, we were well behaved, weren't we, Andy? Yeah, it was good. It was mm-hmm. good. Yeah, we, we had we had an Airbnb for the first three days. Me, Nick, um, and Pierre. Yeah, big th- shout out to Pierre and Rob. Yeah, we. Um, it's great because when you fly to South Africa, there's no time difference. It's an hour time difference. So we flew overnight. Wasn't the greatest flight out there. The flight back was a little bit better, and we just slept most of the most of the night. So you sort of arrive and you're sort of ready for the day, which is great. So I think you can go there and spend three days there or four days there and still come back and still feel okay. Whereas going the other way, you know, across the globe uh, is uh, is challenging. But yeah, it was great. It was um yeah. Humans under management South Africa in, in Alan Gray's um, auditorium was 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 a great day. Uh, it's a good vibe out there. It's sort of a, an emerging financial planning community that are focusing on behavioural, focusing on you know uh, financial planning and stuff. That's all good. And then me and Nick spoke at uh, Old Mutual Wealth, which is a huge organisation out there. If you uh, if you know the sort of South African financial services environment, um, yeah. And we did a forty five minute presentation on a, an enormous stage, uh, but most of it was asking questions, Q and A really. Um, yes, yeah, so it was great. Yeah, we're going to go back next year, 2023. Hopefully, Alan, you're going to come with me, publicly agreeing to that now. Not Carl. I'll come Carl, Carl can comes. come. Carl can come the next okay. year. He can carry oh, the cheers. bags. <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. looked at flights. They're incredibly expensive. I don't know why they're so expensive. So I'm, I'm hoping they're going to come down by the time I book it. Our, our entire profit will go on like my flight out there. I only, I only travel business left. class. Yeah. yeah. If I can't turn left. Going there's actually yeah. not. There's, there's not too much of a price difference between economy, premium economy, and business. Just three and a half grand Good. economy. In that, in that case, I'll four take grand Thank premium, you. five grand business. Yeah. In this case, it would. I be I tell you something else. They shouldn't call it economy. They should call it false economy. Um, I, even, I had, I've never taken sleeping tablets in my life. So we got these sleeping tablets bought for us illicitly at the airport. I took a couple of them, knocked, knocked back a couple of glasses of house red at 38,000 feet and still slept for two hours on a 12 hour flight. And you wake up, everyone else is like, it's like waking up in a morgue, you know, they're all just, <laughs> and I was just looking daggers at this entire plane, these, these gits who were sleeping uh oh crikey okay enough about that we had a, we had a good yeah. oh the one thing i would like to say is the one thing i noticed and i'm sure you did as well andy and we should have asked i should have asked when i was out there a lot more women in the um in attendance at, at um at both events than than you typically get at an event here and I, if i'd had any wits about me i should have asked what you know do, do you know what why is that perhaps um i've yeah. got no I, I i don't know but it's, you know that was refreshing to see um so, yeah. uh, so that's that's all well and good. So let's move on to the meat and potatoes. Um, oh, Carl, before, before we, we do, you... talking of humans oh, yeah. under management, hmm. humans under management. Oh yeah, one sorry, coming yeah, up yeah, yeah. Soon, don't forget, Andrew. Yeah, London is on the tenth of November, uh, roughly two weeks today from when this is launched. It's on Thursday. Um, I'm pretty so- much sold out. Um, there's going to be 300 people in the room in terms of delegates, speakers, exhibitors. Um, so yeah, really looking to just yeah nail it with um the speaker content and um yeah really looking forward to it me and nick are going to do a similar talk to what we did in, in sa so it's just a case of refining it but yeah yeah really looking forward to it so I'm, I'm sure most of the people listening to this would have already bought a ticket but if you haven't there are a couple of last minute tickets so yeah thanks uh, thanks to alan you are hosting a fireside chat aren't you alan we're introducing yeah, a fireside yeah, yeah. chat to the conference which is which is unusual but it's just like a podcast really high risk strategy but fingers crossed it'll work <laughs> hey you got to try these things don't you Exactly. Yep. All it. right, exactly. let's get on with the meat and potatoes. Let's get on with the meat and potatoes, so, Mr. Mr. Widger, Carl. The um, well, this is a this is a well known uh, phrase. It's a it's a condition that affl- afflicts all of us. No, not that one, Carl. And, and I hope it gets better. That cream does normally work. Um, imposter syndrome, my friend. Talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> imposter syndrome. Yeah. So uh, I, this came back into my head recently because uh, when we launched this podcast uh, in the Irish business charts, uh, we went to number three and I immediately, my, my, my brain went to, oh, Jesus Christ, what are we doing at number three? <laughs> what, what do we know? And I know the other people on the podcast with me and I know like you guys are just nothing to be writing home about either. So um, I, I had imposter syndrome on behalf of all four of us, right? But um, 
But I just thought uh, it's amazing when, when, when a topic like this comes to the top of your brain, I started seeing it everywhere um, and started seeing it on Twitter from a couple of other financial advisors who are running businesses and went, you know what, um, I, I think it, 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 it will be a good idea to, to just put it on our agenda and just say, do you know what, it, it's something that affects everybody, no matter how confident you think somebody is or how successful you think somebody is, it's, it's out there all the time. And I, and I remember talking about humans under management. When Andy asked me to speak in 2018 in Dublin, I did a talk and I was really, really nervous because it was in front of my peers and we were doing this financial planning thing that a lot of people in Ireland were going, what is this all about? And anyway, very nervous, prepared, never prepared as much for a talk. Um, did the talk. I think it went down reasonably well, uh, well, based on the feedback. And I got amazing feedback from like competitors of mine and, and peers or whatever. But there was one guy. And that one guy at the lunchtime or one of the coffee breaks said, you were basically talking, he, his, what he said to me was, I think you're talking a load of shite. And, <laughs> and talk about imposter syndrome kicking in because in the days afterwards, the, the 98, 99.99% of people who gave me great feedback all went by the wayside. And the only comment and feedback I could hear was this particular guy. Yeah. Jesus. Um, you know, so it's, it's amazing that um, how our brains work and, and kind of go and trick ourselves almost. And, and I think um, over time, probably like the rest of us, I, I've become a little bit more self-assured. And, you know, when I do get the imposter syndrome, I do kind of just look back and go, well, look how far I've come. Because I'm never thinking that the journey is over or that the growing and learning is over. But I do need to give myself credit for what we have done here in Metis. Um, and that's me and the team together. So when I saw us, oh, Jesus, we're at number three in the charts, uh, what are people going to think? Um, then I kind of take stock and I say, okay, yeah, but look, we have actually, um, you know, built up a fairly successful business. And, and for us, like we have big goals to move this, uh, you know, forward and, and, and grow it an awful lot more. But, um, yeah, I, I just thought, um, especially you guys, because you, you guys are, you guys are the thought leaders. You're the, you're the heroes of the financial planning profession. So, so I said, I'd put it on the agenda to, to provoke oh, you all to, to, oh, to, 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 to provoke you all to admit that yes, indeed, you guys also suffer from imposter syndrome and that that would be um, good comfort for all other financial advisors and business owners out there to just acknowledge it. I think that's why I wanted to kind of put it on the agenda. Alan Smith, have you, you, yeah, you it's, it's, it's probably it's, not for you. It, yeah. Ne never, never been affected by it in my life. What are you talking about? No. Huh? We should be, what do you mean? You've got number three. We should have been number one. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, I, I, I should have pointed out actually, um, we, I needn't have worried because I think we're about 154 yeah, now. <laughs> Flash in a pan. Uh, exactly. We had our five minutes of fame. No, you, you're right. It's funny you, you say that. The because um, you, you're all on the the reviews. You, as you say, you get ninety nine percent people saying amazing. You did one, one. It must be the human condition, right? We are we are sort of destined to look for you know trouble or problems or negativity. You, you know, as we know, I've I've got a separate podcast and we've got I've got sixty odd reviews at the moment, all five star, and I'm just waiting for that one Wait, to come yeah, in, which is you've got to get a one star. Be, because I know that you two guys, Andy and Nick, when you your ongoing podcast, Nick's podcast is done and you've had one star reviews. And you've been very public about it, haven't you? You've you've sort of promoted yeah. it. That I've got this one instead and it would you're right, that would kill me. It's gonna to happen to me one day and I'm just gonna be so crestfallen, just so absolutely gutted by it. But Andy, you've uh, you promote it, don't you? You say I've had this one star review. Well there was one recently he said he he he, 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 he keeps saying the same thing, buy global equities, which I think is a yeah, it's a badge of honor, isn't it? But if 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 you just bought global equities your entire life, you'd create incredible wealth what, what more do you want from a money podcast <laughs> that is the message basically yeah and, and nick we all know nick murray your hero has basically created an entire career out of saying the same thing over yeah. and over and yeah, over 400 again. different so. 400 different ways to say buy yeah. equities and never sell them yeah, yeah. Let, let me let me uh, imposter syndrome yeah I'll, I'll share a, i'll share a quick story with you <laughs> grab yourself a drink a very long drink it's story time with Alan Smith. 
Thank you, Nick. We're not going to do that every single episode, are we? Well, no, no, as long I as I tell a story, won't. I'll try to keep this short. A few years ago, I, I mean, God knows how or why, I managed to get myself invited to a very kind of prestigious dinner. It was in a very fancy restaurant, and I was... I saw the guest list and it was all, the, it was, it was who's who senior, senior CEOs, chairman of major, major financial services businesses. I mean, listed companies, FTSE 100 companies and me. <laughs> and so I, I think, okay, I'll go along for this dinner. And I just thought, Oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to keep quiet, not say anything. Not um, <laughs> what's, what's that saying? It's better to remain silent and be thought of a fool than to, uh, than, 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 than to speak and remove all doubt. Yeah. 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 So I just kept quite, and honestly, just sitting right beside me was literally the chairman. I obviously won't mention names. Chairman, chairman of a FTSE 100 company, up to all sorts of things. And the, and the conversation around the room, I just thought, what am I doing here? Talk ultimate imposter syndrome. And so halfway through the dinner, and I guess a few wines had been consumed by this time. There's a guy across <laughs> across the table from me, and he had achieved amazing things again. But built a business from scratch to a huge na national business in financial services. And he said, um, he just come out with it. He's a real good icebreaker. He said, I don't know why I'm here. He said, I've been making things up. <laughs> I've been making it up as I go along since I started. I don't know why I'm, I'm here with all you very senior people. And I'll tell you, then the next guy went, I was thinking exactly the same. And everyone around the table all kind of just broke into spontaneous conversations. Say, yeah, I was thinking the same. I saw your name on the list. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, regardless of who you are or what that I means the, the status of some people and i was thinking we're all just human beings aren't we we're all kind of we're all making it up as we go along we're all just hoping to be slightly better than we were yesterday but you know a lot of people will put on you put on a, a defense you hope not to get found out or caught up but it was just i'll never forget that having the biggest imposter syndrome of my life and then realizing that every other person around the table had exactly the same i'm sure that's uh, you've all, all got experiences a bit like that I um, am yeah. when in in South Africa when we when we when we spoke at the old mutual event it was at this beautiful resort Arabella, the Arabella Golf and Spa Resort. It's about an hour and a half outside of Cape Town. I, I, God knows where. I didn't even look on the map where it was. That's just how little interest I actually paid to the country when I was there in terms of the geography. But it's a beautiful. I mean, it's an absolutely gorgeous resort. Andy and I were staying. We had they were we were in suites, looking out over this golf course and this bay, and I'm thinking. Why am I here? Why, <laughs> in, in what parallel universe does South African advisors want to hear what I've got to say? Um, and then I had a scotch and everything became normal again. Um, it was, it was a and, and you sent us a video then from your Swedish yeah. to show us. Uh, and then you went for breakfast. Was. Yeah. Andy, do you have any, uh, any thoughts around this, this phenomenon, phenomenon of, um, I can't even say it, imposter syndrome? Yeah, yeah, I suppose quite a lot. Um, I think when you first have it, you don't you don't even know what it is. Uh, I think that's the first step in it is when you learn that it is actually a thing. Um, I mean, I've probably suffered from it my entire career because I've always been um, usually the youngest advisor in the room. C can I just say you are amazing at hiding it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've all, I've always been the True. youngest advisor in the room. Um, it's slowly Not changing anymore. now. Well, now I'm a, I'm an in betweener advisor, aren't I? There's the there's the next gen. Let's call them the in betweeners and the uh, and then the old buggers, um, which you guys are. You know, take your pick where you where you sit. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, I think you have it in your career. You have it when you're doing content. You have it when you're speaking. Um, I suppose it's like anything, isn't it? Like nerves and stuff, and anxiety and stress. You just get better at managing it. Um, but my mantra is just do the work, wake up every day, do the work, whatever that is. You know, I'm just constantly just sort of thinking that in my mind, really. But yeah, it's uh, definitely a thing that people suffer from. But, but yeah, like all yeah. Things, can I, can, you, just on that, Andy, like I, I, I think, yeah. um, like especially for you, and you've built four or five brands at this stage, like, like it is incumbent on us all to just take a moment sometimes and take a step back. You can sometimes get too involved in just doing the work, but like, have some periods of reflection where you go, wow, I've actually, look what I've actually done. You know, and yeah, I think that, yeah, that, yeah. that those moments of reflection really do stand to you. And I think they make you um, almost stronger and better to go and do the next phase, whatever that might be. So, well, you know, I think celebrating well, your, your, your achievements to date is, is equally as important as driving on and going to the next, to the next phase. 
A hundred percent. I mean, it is all about the journey. There is no destination, you know, regardless of the fact that you think someone succeeded and they've got there. I guarantee you when they, th- when you think they've got there, they're standing there saying, I'm just getting started. So yeah, it's very much about the journey uh, and not the destination. Adam. You know, um, Dan Sullivan, strategic coach guy, who's been advising entrepreneurs for you know, 50 30 years. years or something. Yeah. yeah a long time. Um, he he writes, he talks about this. He's got a book about it. It's called The Gap. He calls it The Gap, The Entrepreneurial Gap, which is you look. You, all of us are future focused and we're saying, God, I haven't even, all these other things I haven't done yet, I haven't done. He said, honestly, like you say, Carl, sometimes take stock and look back on how far you've come. The last 12 months, the last three years, the last five years, give yourself the gift of that. Just for a minute, you know, congratulate yeah. yourself and, and then get on with it. I think that's... Uh, yeah, that is, that's good advice. I, the way that I summarize this is that is because I often do think, you know, when you say to me, Andy, can you go and speak at this hum conference? I think, I don't, I don't know. And, and the worst thing is your peers, other people in the profession, I think, God, there's some really smart people out there. What the hell do I know? All I know is I'm two or three years ahead of some people and I'm two or three years behind other people. And all I want to do, if I can share my knowledge, experience and ideas with people that are behind me on the journey, just because I'm older than them, for example, then that's got to be a good thing. So just relax about it and not be, not think that I have to live up to some sort of ridiculously uh, ambitious, you know, um, view of, or vision. If you just come from the, from the premise of trying to help people and every now and again, you will get shot down or you'll mess up or fluff it. It doesn't matter. Do just you, get up and crack. do you remember who that advisor was, Carl? Like, is it in, oh, is it <laughs> in your head? <laughs> no, you're a very clever boy, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> that was you. a stupid question. Okay. 100%. So, <laughs> I, I was just looking at your hum feedback score. You got 8.3 out of 10. So, you know, that's the answer, mate. And that's a, a, a blind survey, as in they don't what think did, you're uh, see it. What did I get? Yeah, I'm getting oh, into you. Yes. You actually did get 8.7 out of 10. I think you were the highest speaker that day. Yes, Thank you, you were. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Imposter play syndrome. Play, play to the audience. The topic is imposter syndrome. And Alan Smith <laughs> just asked, what score did I get? Because he knows he was the number one yeah, speaker. Yeah. Well, it was very wrong, close. There's though. nothing it wrong with being competitive. We like that. We like that. I, um, I, I, did, my, I did for myself with my score by, by opening my dress as Good Evening Belfast. <laughs> um, when the event was being held outside mm-hmm. Dublin, um, that might have, that might have cost me a few points. I think on the uh, on the on the ratings, maybe maybe. Is it that did. all right, Carl? Have we covered this? Anything more on imposter syndrome? Mm-hmm. We're going to move on. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's like I mean, like we could be looking at say Twitter followers for imposter syndrome, and you know, I I there, therefore be feeling you know the runt of the litter because I have less followers than the four of you guys, or the other three of you guys. Who? Apparently, which one of tw- which which one? Twitter of doesn't count anymore. Apparently, it's, it's LinkedIn now. Is apparently the way. Uh, I've no. I never look at it. I never look at Twitter followers. I'm just here mm-hmm. to serve the serve mm-hmm. the community. That's all uh, I want to do. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> the, move it. on. Move on. Quick. <clears throat> Me and Alan Smith have got. Oh, right. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we've done imposter syndrome. I think we all suffer it to a degree. I think, and just maybe if I just close on this quick, we we will suffer it more because we're outgoing and we're asked to speak. A lot of people aren't asked to speak because they don't want to speak, and that's fine. We've all got different skill sets, so we do kind of put ourselves out there to be shot down sometimes. Um, and and also, but when you're on that stage, you you know it's it's because we are the kind of personalities that want to do that and want to give back, and that's not for everybody. So we um, we're already kind of in a bit of a, 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 a segment, as it were. So Andy, um, you have. A, a topic you want to talk about, beauty parades, in or out? Expand, my good friend. Yeah, so this is obviously something that every single advisor, every single person in business really goes through. And what the classic beauty parade is, is someone is a client and they're looking for a service. In our situation, it's Mr. and Mrs. Usually. They're looking for a financial advisor. Uh, they think they're the prize, let's just call it that, uh, as in a new client. Uh, they may or may not be. And then they go and see three firms. Um and they want the three firms to put on a beauty parade. That's the, that's the saying. Uh, as in, pitch me, why should I go with you type situation. Um, and I know some firms do a lot of this, certainly in the investment management world, where it's just an investment mandate. Yeah. They want them to see facts, figures, data, portfolio. Oh, I mean, it just must be excruciating. In the financial planning world, it's more 
I'm aware of this firm. I'm aware of this person. I, I get the feeling, gut feeling. I want to go with them. Can I become a client? Are you taking on new clients? And it's a bit, it's a bit more like that. Um, so yeah, over the years, I've sort of pandered to this somewhat if I've been, you know, desperate for clients or whatever. But in recent years, I'm, I'm less up for it. I, 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 I attract people that sort of want to be a client of mine rather than looking for a, an advisor on the internet. Um, and if I know there's a beauty parade going on, I'll try and not get involved in it. And I'll say to the client, look, if you're looking at a few firms, just, you know, go with whoever you feel, you know, I'm, I'm sort of declaring myself out here. If you want to work with me directly, then we can sort of progress this forward. Most of my clients or all of my clients come from recommendation or because they're, you know, podcast listeners or something like that. So I think beauty parades is quite a big, chunky area. So, um, yeah, who's going to take that next let, let me let me i'll quickly talk about it then I'll, I'll i've done my piece i don't because i take my clients all by referral yep <clears throat> i was just thinking when you were talking there andy i was trying to think the last time i had a beauty parade and it would have been about three months ago and, and i went along with it i gave them one meeting online they didn't come with me uh which is fine but that, that's the first one forever and uh yeah i i um i don't i, I can't talk for carl or andy around they'll 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 add their their thoughts yeah. at the moment but i just don't get just typically don't get involved with them um and i was quite surprised the last one was a beauty parade uh, i think where they were referred from i think because we run quite small businesses and we're sort of personality brands we, we don't come across it that much but so I, but i know these guys um do come across it so over to you guys really do you want um, me to go alan or, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just say I, I haven't got much to say i don't think on this uh, i was asked recently it was it a beauty parade, but it was somebody who was looking for an advisor, had been referred, was considering engaging with, uh, how do I describe, the largest wealth management company in the UK. And then before yeah. he did, thought, can I just have a chat with you? And asked you me the dreaded... don't know the power of the dark side. <laughs> and before... It, so the question to me, it was a Zoom call, was... Alan, tell me, tell me how you're different. And I hate Ooh. that question because oh. how, and you talk, we mentioned Nick Murray earlier on. Nick Murray's got yeah, a lot to he, say he covers on this, this. He? Yeah. and he says, well, first of all, I don't know. He, 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 what is he says? He says, can you imagine being asked, imagine you're a, an eminent neurosurgeon or something, you know, a, a, you know, a qualified <laughs> doctor, you go along before your heart surgery. Listen, uh, Mr. Surgeon doctor, tell me, how are you different <laughs> from the other surgeons out there? You just... And it, 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 it just it, says, it, shut up and sit down. I'm going to um, operate on you. I'm the best. Well, but the, in the, the world. answer, the answer, I mean, that's what Nick Murray says is, I don't know, because I don't know what other people do. I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I can guess by looking at websites, but I honestly don't know how everyone else operates. What I do know is how we operate, and only you can, can decide or, or, or can um, choose. The answer is, you can, because the trouble is, you enter those things, you can, it's the person who says the most appealing thing wins. So if you were to say, I think we can give you higher investment returns than someone else. Yeah. Then maybe, maybe you, you, you win. And I mean, we've talked about this in the past, having integrity, having integrity costs you because you mm. just tell the unvarnished truth to people. And people sometimes don't want to hear the unvarnished truth. You know, what, what do you think about the markets? What are they going to do? And you say, I have no idea. People don't like to hear that. Whereas others, and I've certainly been in yeah. beauty parades, what, you know, like everyone, won our fair share of beauty parades and, and lost quite a few as well. And I don't, God, you know, I don't regret the ones we lost because we just, you know, I know we told the truth and stuck to it. So in summary, what I'd rather get to is a place where people are coming to us because they just want to deal with us as a, co as a consequence of either content that we've created and pushed it out in the world and they've liked it and engaged with it and or personal introduction from long-term clients. What I don't want is people who are going, you know, classic internet inquiries. I've done a bit of Googling and I'm, and I'm going to speak to three companies. Tell me why you're different. Carl, do you want to jump in? I've got a couple more points to make on it. Yeah, I, look, I, all, all very relevant points. Like, honestly, we don't see ourselves in being asked to get involved in beauty parades because a little bit like Nick said, it's mostly from referral. Um, and I, but, but back in the days when we were saying that we knew what the best pension fund was, being honest, before we did real financial planning, we were in loads of them. Um, and what I found is we, we were in one recently, so I'll just tell you that story actually, right? Um, so we were there's always asked one. To, there's always one. Yeah, we were nah, asked that, to go that in. didn't apply to us. Oh, actually, last week we uh, no, I'm joking. Yeah, 
um, we, we were asked in because I knew one of the partners in this firm, right? So, and we were up against all the, the big shots, right? Um, and I knew they're not going to want a kind of boutique financial planning firm, even though we knew that's what they needed. But anyway, we didn't get it. Um, and it was no surprise. Um, and my buddy showed me some of the presentations afterwards and go back to Alan's point about integrity. There was just stuff that was wrong. Yeah. Stuff that they knew was incorrect. Like your management charge is going to be X and I'm going, uh, that's not what the total expense ratio is. There's VAT on top of that. There are trading costs or, you know, and it's like, so did we do the right thing? I think we told them exactly what we felt we, where we could add value, right? That's all we can do, I suppose. Um, so I'd be hesitant to get involved in, in too many of them, but honestly, we're not, we're not asked in, you know, um, cause we don't go after like, you know, it's financial planning is what we do for families. So we're not asked to, you know, punt for a mandate of 20 million or 10 million or far, whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, not, not wouldn't be jumping up and down if we were asked tomorrow to get, uh, to, to pitch in four or five beauty parades, that wouldn't be success as far as I'm concerned. Okay. A couple of other points on this. Um, I also think it's important to, for you to have a process of taking on new clients and prospects as in, even if they're potentially interested in you, you still follow your process. And in my world, that's every client needs to fill in uh, a discovery form, which is, I think, incredibly <clears throat> well worded, well laid out. You know, how did you hear about us? Did someone recommend us? How can we help or open questions? What is your main financial concern at the moment? Have you worked with a financial advisor before? If so, how did that go? Um, so I've got quite a tight screening process and a lot will be unearthed in, 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 via that form. And then obviously I'll have a usually Zoom meeting with them and then take it from there. I think actually a client that I'm working with now that's doing a, a new investment for, for something, I think I was involved in a beauty par par parade with him, but the other advisor was so terrible. It was just, it was, it, it, I, I know the advisor as well. I, I know Andy, we Andy, can't Andy, do. Said, Mandy, mate, this is our conversation. I, I, I wasn't on form that day. I've had this <laughs> <off>. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I can't be up against this guy. This is a career low. Uh, and anyway, the client was like, the, the client was like, Andy, I'm not even going to have the second meeting with this. It's clear that it's just night and day. So I was like, fine, that's brilliant. We'll do that. The other thing as well, which is a bit of an extension to this, unless anyone wants to jump in. Is, just on is, that before you on, on that exact, on that very point, we will get people come to us and as you know we quite often work with um, business owners who've exited sold their business and they get a big lump of money hits their bank account their literal current account and guess what happens they get a phone call from from well, the bank yeah. God, from the yeah. from the bank coots yeah well but it's, but it's not coots isn't it it's because everyone's just been had normal bank accounts <laughs> oh yeah like barclays so, so, something with a big load of zeros lands and everyone goes do you remember oh do, can we have a call, please? Do you remember and... we spoke about it, Alan? That, that, sorry, sometimes it's like a bank account that some guy set up or girl set up, whether no, no, at uni. Yeah, whether at uni. So it's like w w Warwick Barclays has got 12 and a half million landed. Yeah. They're going, what are we doing? Who's this person? Now, that's, that, is, that's, <laughs> that is actually true, setting up, you know, first bank account when you're, when you're at uni and they're usually running student overdrafts. All of a sudden, yeah, someone lands yeah. it. They get the call. <laughs> Um, but I would also, I'd, I would speak to these prospective clients and I, because I, I know, and again, it's, it's, it's slightly risky, but I think it's a good thing to do because they'll say, look, I've been asked to go and meet with the blah, 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 private banking unit of this company, this bank that I've been banking with for 20 years. They haven't spoken to me in 20 years, but now they want to speak to me. And I say, you should go and meet them, go and see what they've got to say, because touch wood so far without fail, they come back and say, <laughs> I'm absolutely making the right choice to go with you because a lot of these organizations aren't well suited to dealing with the sort of clients that we want to deal with. Um, it's, you know, it's big brand. They've got, you know, nice office furniture yeah, um, and all that sort of, but, but um, it's quite, if anything, it removes or reduces the kind of buyer's remorse that sometimes you have. If they've gone with you without seeing anyone else, they might say, I wonder if there's something better out there. So it's not a bad thing. You don't yeah. know who your competition is, but certainly <laughs> if, if our potential client wants to go and see one of the big brand sort of national banks, or the private banking arm, um, I would say, yeah, fine. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think right, it's yeah. a strength, strengthens our, our, our sort of more boutique proposition. I, I, I think be yourself uh, and don't pander. Um, and as you say, tell the truth. And some, some, some you'll land, some you won't. Uh, just an extension on this. I don't know if it's, just, it's, if, if it's a related topic. It sort of is. Uh, references. So when they potentially go, okay, yep, we want to go with you guys now then. 
uh, have you got any references from existing clients? God, I used to turn myself in knots dealing with this issue. Now I provide zero references. And on my initial uh, sort of page for them to become a client, I've got it written out. I do not provide references for ex- from existing clients. It's likely I've come highly recommended by someone you trust or you've found me from my financial education content. In my early years, I pro- provided references. Now I don't. Trust your gut or don't work with me. I've never let any of the families I serve down. That's what I tell them now. I'm, I'm not pissing around with that. <clears throat> because Andy, what you... <laughs> the ultra crepidarian Andy... <laughs> He knows about everything, <coughs> and he can't be told anything. His name is Andrew Hart. Andrew Hart! What a okay. voice. So what do we Thank think you. about references? This is, again, is something that they, they think... Never mind thing. references. What do we think about that jingle? Ultra crepidarian, come on. I'll just give... Yeah, I didn't catch this is, is, that what, is that what she said? This is a oh, yeah, new sure, word that I taught Nick, and I'm, I'm, I'm popularizing the word. It's called ultra crepidarian. It basically means someone who thinks they know a subject well, but they don't, um, you know, in the investment <laughs> world. <laughs> we're, all ult- we're all ultra crepidarians. Um, a chef friend of mine introduced it to me. Um, it's, it's a fascinating word, uh, ultra crepidarian. I'm going to be talking about it at hum. Yeah, so references, what do we think about that? So what I used to do is they'd say, do you work with similar people like me? And I'm like, yeah, I work with humans and money. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> of course I do. <laughs> Next. And then they're like, oh, do you work with, you know, certain wealth, certain characteristics? You know, and then I have to think, well, maybe. Yeah. Anyway, then I'd have to get three names on a list. Contact the clients first, say, I'm going to take on a guy called Carl. He's asked for references. Can I put you on the list? Yes, you can. Put the three people on the list. Send it to Carl, for example. And then he may or may not call them. And as if I'm going to give that person three names that are not going to speak yeah, highly that's, of that, me. That's, that's so, the thing, so, so the whole yeah. thing is loaded. It's a waste of time. Um, yeah, anyway, Test, that's my... Testimonial, testimonial videos on your website. That's, yeah, that, that's, that, that would deal with a lot of it, yeah. That's yeah, what we do. You can see yeah. the... Yeah, so um, you've you've so you, and I think that is it's kind of you and I spoke about this a couple of years ago, and I thought, why wouldn't you? It's quite not a bad thing to do. Just have a, have them have a conversation with a client who's a little bit like them. It does impose somewhat on your existing client because who who wants to take a random phone call from someone else? Um, but we, well, I mean, we've all got clients who are advocates who proudly want to yeah. share their thing. So you know, we, I mean, I take a different view. If somebody did say, could I have a conversation with someone else? It's kind of a bit like them. We've yeah. all, I've got <laughs> half a dozen of real, real advocates that are always happy to have a, have a yeah, they kind okay. of want us to do well, want other. But just, wh- yeah, I'm kind uh, of neutral. Uh, uh, again, so, so again, I'm someone who uses lots of services, lots of professionals. The other thing as well, someone get highly recommended by a family member, say go and use Andy, and then they'll still want references. And I think your best mate, your brother's recommended yeah. me. He's been using him for seven years. Is that not enough of a testimonial that I've now got to run off and speak to? Andy, do you get this a lot then? Because I, I haven't had. No, I don't get a lot. I don't get a lot. Ten years. I don't get you're a very, lot. I, I, you're very passionate about something you don't get a lot. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I've dealt with it. I've dealt with it. And then the final thing on this, the final thing on this is I use professional services. So, for example, you say, "Oh, Andy, it's really important when someone's looking after your money." When I was looking for a childminder, a childminder come highly recommended from a lady who a friend of mine who I incredibly like she's done all the research she's been using this lady for five years we rocked up we said right <laughs> here are the kids she's like oh do you want the paperwork do you want references I'm like no nothing sign up they're in you know and they're my kids because they're highly recommended from someone I know incredibly well like again it's the same with the money it's I don't know it's, it's, it's a bit odd anyway yeah what's that yeah I mean I just I think we're coming to the end of this beauty parades segment genre subject um interesting I, the one I had recently, I'm, Alan sort of got me thinking about this, the integrity thing. I think I, well, you know, we're all quite blunt and direct, aren't we? And we tell people the truth as we see it. And I think I doubled down on it because I knew if it's a beauty parade, I know elsewhere they're going to be given graphs and numbers and they're going to be fibbed maybe about the fees. Yeah. So I, I went uh, ultra Lincoln on them just to get it over and done with really. So uh, that might, that's, that's, that, that's, that's the thing. Ultra Lincoln, not just ultra, Lincoln. Ultra. Ultra Lincoln. I went. I went hardcore. Ultra Lincoln. Did you um, ask we, to just leave the premises immediately? Just get out. Don't dark and I just, I just ended, the, I ended the Zoom meeting without saying oh, goodbye. Zoom. I just. I just yeah. hung up. Yeah, that's just... what I'm doing. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. And you didn't um, get the business. Wow. No, no. Amazing. Amazing. We've uh, we're forty minutes in. We've still got to do our listeners' questions and our and our uh, our culture corner. 
there's a subject Alan you put on t- for discussion. Can we? I think what we might do, and that subject was solopreneur versus growing a practice, and that's a massive, massive subject. subject. I think it's going to be uh, yeah, of, it's, of it's come up from a few a few trappists. Yeah, a few have, have asked about it, but it's a big one. Maybe we will do a more a, a bigger theme. Next well, I time think should, should we announce, should we announce it now? So that will be the lead off subject for the net for episode six in two weeks' time. So if you're interested in, in that discussion around solopreneur versus growing a practice, that will be our lead off discussion, and it could is be that, a discussion that takes up the bulk of the show. So if you've got any questions. That, is, around that get it in on the link on the pin tweet at the top of our at we'll do a proper proper channel. debate we'll have the solos against the firms right we'll yeah well, exactly right. we'll go at it really hard will that will that be a live episode nick live <laughs> on youtube i, I doubt no. it very much my friend no um but keep on asking and i'll keep on saying no excellent um i think it's time that we move on to the next section where we <clears throat> handle uh, questions from our beloved trappists so let's crack on and do it now, I've got the, these questions are quite verbose. That's another one, Andy. You can add that and, and enjoy it later on. <laughs> these questions are quite verbose. So I'm going to read these out. Don't, don't lose the will to live as I do it. The first one is from Sam B. Didn't supply a Twitter handle, unfortunately, so he may not even be on Twitter. So I don't, on that note, guys, I'm just live talking here, but I, maybe we shouldn't have questions unless the Twitter handle is, is supplied because then we can tag them in the, in the notes and he gets the conversation going. But then maybe we'll exclude people who aren't on Twitter by doing that, just a thought. Anyway, Sam B., who hasn't given me a Twitter handle, says, I am part of a family financial planning business. Our investment philosophy is heavily weighted towards the long-term power of global equities. Okay, all good. Our most aggressive portfolio is 100% equities, but our second most aggressive is 85 equities and 15% cash. Over the long term, do you think it's better to have 80% equities and 20% bonds or 85% equities and 15% cash? Would like all of you to answer, but particularly Nick and Andy, as I have consumed their content before and would love to hear their thoughts. So I'll quickly leave, and Andy, maybe you tie a tie bow on it. I, 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 you're splitting hairs. I mean, it's 80 yeah. mm. equities, 20 bonds, or 85 equities. You've made the big decision, which is to have the bulk of the money in, in, in the great companies of the world. That's that's, and the other the other 15 or 20 percent is dead money. Whether you let it die in cash, you let it die in bonds, and you have fun, it just, don't sweat it. That doesn't make any difference. The big thing is getting the money into real assets. So re, you know, the, the, uh, 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 an investment that's going to give you a rising income stream and rising profits, and that's the great hedge against inflation don't sweat it beyond that and ideally get all your clients as much as you can within the constraints of your compliance and that's the next question uh, to 100 percent equities andy that's a good term nick dead money it will die in cash or die in bonds mm. yeah very good thank you yeah I, 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 I think uh yeah it's not a i mean i mean don't you know hopefully that's not keeping them up at night jesus christ you must have other issues to worry about in the business it's a family business <laughs> you know how am i going to kick and how am i going to kick dad out or whatever um or mum um so um yeah uh, it, it it depends on the client uh, i mean if they're a an accumulating client a, a saving client then uh, it's a bit of a, a mute point it doesn't really matter i mean if they're a spending client then having it in bonds or having it in cash Again, it depends on the, the overall situation. You know, I need to you know create a financial plan, speak to the client, yada yada yada. But it's not. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Nick. It's not hugely important. Uh, over to you, Carl. Yeah, irrelevant would be uh, what I think about that. And 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 but 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 I'm guessing that this could be. Don't don't know, but my guess would be this is somebody at the outset of their career and getting too um, yeah. worried about um, you know the detail. Uh, Look, d- 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 don't sweat it. Just get people mostly invested in equities if you can at all. As as I said in one of the previous episodes, keep it really simple. So dimensional world allocation or Vanguard life strategies, set them up, set them on their way, and then make sure they stick with the plan. Um, and if it's fit for purpose at the outset, it is almost always fit for purpose when there are temporary market declines. So um, don't get into the nitty gritty uh you've you've nailed the big question which is what yeah. drives the most return equities yeah i agree um overthinking it a bit there's a phrase i mean this i mean this positively but naive complexity overthinking it's not that complex it's 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 big picture stuff we're talking generally we talk about three decade investing <clears throat> you know that's a that's a long 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 time and and you've answered the biggest question as you say um to quote andrew hart the best portfolio is the one that you're going to stick with through all seasons. So whether it's the, the, either one of those two that was described, if you stick with it, you'll do okay. Next. Okay. 
I think that's, that's, that leads nicely on to the next question. But I think the point that you, uh, Andy made, I think he probably is a younger person. And we've all been there. We all get immersed in the weeds. We think that's the important stuff. And then over time, we, we unlearn. We unlearn everything we thought was important to find. 100%. Out. But that, 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 that doesn't make the, the um, question invalid. You know, it's, no, a, it's, no. it's a question that probably a lot of people no, have. Absolutely. And, it's and a question hopefully... I would have asked 20 years ago, I'm sure. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Okay, the next question is from Will S. Again, didn't leave a Twitter handle. And this one is, uh, oh, crikey. okay, let's go. <gasps> Deep breath. If a planner is under a compliance-driven risk profiling question system, such as Oxford Risk or what have you, and the client's in retirement and they do the questionnaire and come out at low medium and you have a chat with the clients, they seem cautious, inexperienced, um, and you put them into a portfolio that aligns with the risk profile questionnaire, say 40 to 60% equities, but you know that they should be in 70 to 90 how do you get around that? Couldn't that come under scrutiny from the scary regulator? So I think what Willis is asking is, how, you know, if, if, they, if they grade at a certain level via the mumbo jumbo questionnaire, yeah. how can then you put, put them into what the, the regulator compliance would deem a higher risk portfolio without um, causing problems for you and maybe causing problems for the client later on down the line when the portfolio has a totally normal temporary decline? I will answer that, but I'll, you guys go first. So one of you come back on that. Let, let me just come in quickly on this. Uh, I always believe that the, the risk profiler questionnaire, should you choose to use one, is just the icebreaker. It's the opening part of the conversation, right? It's a, mm -hmm. it is, is it? part of it's a, just, it's, it's, well, it's, it's part icky. of a, it's, it is, but, uh, but it's you, one way or another, you've got to identify. It's not, it's your not a nice opening, opening the conversation. I imagine being in a bar and just talking to a random person. Oh, you know, it's I part, it's part of an engagement thing, but, but here's, it, it, it's the same old stuff, isn't it? It's identifying the difference between what, or really what risk is. And as we know, yeah. the industry has got risk confused with short term volatility. Right. That's, yeah, that's exactly. the biggest thing. Yeah. One thing that I think is just a useful, you know, th there is no way of predicting what's going to happen in the future, but history is a guide, right? There's a hundred years plus of data to say, if you choose this portfolio, this is a likely long term outcome. If you choose this portfolio, this is a different alternative. The you know just choose choose your roller coaster ride. They're all roller coaster rides. They're all up and down. Some are more volatile than others, but they they arrive at dif dif different destinations over this amazing sort of three decade plus time horizon. So I think you do have the conversation, but you say if we follow this route, which is ticking all the boxes and is compliant, the outcome is likely to be suboptimal. So here's something else to have a conversation around. And that's where the advisor adds value, surely. It's having yeah. those rich conversations, but you do have to document it. This is the thing. We're, you know, we're all kicking around these thoughts and ideas, but there is a compliant process. We are working in regulated compliant businesses. We so are. you've got to somewhat play the game. I, mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. You've, you've got to really understand what your client's philosophy is. And I, I'm quite a fan of, 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 sort of documenting what I call a very simplistic investment policy statement. Because I, I can guarantee you this portfolio will have a short-term correction of X percent at some future point. Here's what we're going to do. It's a, it's a classic lifeboat drill. In advance of this, let's agree now. So when it happens and you're in a state of heightened emotion, we're going to go back and say this is what we agreed to do. Everyone should, you know, should seek higher returns over the longer term because that gives greater options to the client and, and to the family. Freedom. So yeah, that, freedom, that's, yeah, freedom, yeah. That, that's, that's my, my thoughts. I, oh, I've, got, I've got a real life case with this. So I look after one half of the couple and then the other half of the couple is now becoming a client. They've just uh, a lot of money just landed and the other half that's now a client has never invested before. Um, I'm filling in my uh, investment profile. So never invested in collective investments, never, in, never chosen funds before, never invested in the stock market, never done any alternative investments, never done an investment property. Um, you know, like all of the answers you, uh, zero, zero to 10 uh, experience, she puts zero. Um, but then on the question about how willing are you to deal with short-term volatility to get a better return, that was answered 10, zero to 10. It's all just conflicting, you know, answers via these, you know, complex questions really for, for clients, even though we look at it and think it's a simple question why they're struggling with it. So I now have this somewhat dilemma. Obviously I've spoken at length with them about volatility and gone through all the numbers the most important page that me and Nick, I know, use in our suitability letters is 25 years worth of um, calendar year returns. Isn't that right, Nick? Um, so we yeah. have, uh, uh, and generally, 25% of those years are red, 75% are black, as in positive versus negative. That is the key page that we want our clients to be looking at. Um, 
I think that trumps most of the other questions, most of the other reports, most of the other data. Um, yeah, that's an incredibly important page. Uh, you guys, you, I don't think share. you guys use, I don't think you use Timeline, do you? Timeline is very good. Nice. No. Uh, no. uh, yes. Using I, actual uh, yeah, real I, life historic data, you know, the, 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 the future won't replicate the past, but it, there'll be similarities. And it goes oh, through, definitely, you know, definitely. bloody world wars, you name it. But, and this but, is like, it's a happen. But, but the page that me and Nick are sharing is uh, their portfolio last 25-year calendar returns, end-of-year calendar returns, which why have we picked that period? That could be argued all day. It just is what it is. You know, Time is a human construct, but we've got to work within it. Um, and that's, that's the most important page that um, we share. <clears throat> but it is a challenge, um, and a lot of people – um, are being, I call, I call the misconception mirrors attitude to risk questionnaires. I know obviously people are going to say, no, ours is different. This is better. Um, but I think why well, would say if someone's going to complete a risk questionnaire and they're going to end up in a low risk portfolio, what the hell am I doing here anyway? Then if they're going to work with me and be a client of but mine, isn't, isn't, I'm going to hold that... their hand. I'm going to get them the returns. Why would they end up in a portfolio? That they end up on their own. It's like, no, there's a professional involved here. I know where the returns are going to come from. I'm going to hold your hand. I might have to hold your hand a bit tighter and, you know, be a bit more attentive to your nervousness. Um, you know, I think they say you want to find out how loud they're going to knock on your office door. <laughs> you know, is this just going to be a little uh, a little bit of uh, market volatility or is it going to be a bang, 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 bang? Which I think yeah, is I, I, I like surely this is a question about what real financial planning is. It's not actually about risk questionnaires. Yeah. It's... Um, so this is the crux of it. It doesn't really matter what the risk profile questionnaires come out from. And we had a, a conversation the last day about, you know, what is what makes a financial planner? And I think it's the interpretation of the financial plan is what makes a real financial planner. So yes. you can say, okay, well, if you're coming out at a level two out of seven or whatever you're coming out at, yeah. well, here's the likely returns. Um, and that means you're going to run out of money when you're, 73 and that's a who said sub optimal that's yeah. kind of sub optimal right so um so it's like it's 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 coaching educating and bringing them on that journey as to here's where we need to get to so if we need a a return of five percent for annum here's the type of portfolio you're going to have to look at even yeah. though your risk profile said a lot so okay. it's it's just bringing them on that journey and i think yeah. um the, the documentation of how you bring them on that journey then, Adam, we've we've struggled with that one. And where we've fallen now, um, and it's really working, I think, is, and our compliance, head of compliance, Sinead, loves this, is once the meeting is done, you do a video to the client. And it's just a, it's a, it's a debrief video uh, whereby we just chat about the main topics of what we, we went on. And, and, you know, we bring it up in the video to say, and you came out at a two out of seven, and we think you should be in a four out of seven or whatever, right? And, yeah. and but talk about it in layman's terms, because then we have it documented that it's on the file. We did speak about it, and we have reminded you with this update video afterwards. Um, and I think that's a really good way of making sure that it's it's in your file. And I think that gets around your issue, which I think was in the question about you know, well, how do you how do you solve that compliance risk um and i think that 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 definitely helps help doing that I, so I, that's I, how we that's how we do it i really like the concept nick introduced a few years ago capacity for cash so any new investments now i have modeled the financial plan with cash returns and the money runs out very quickly and i and i, I remember showing the client only a, only about three weeks ago <clears throat> i said well this is if your money's in cash and he said well we're not going to do that are we and i said no 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 we're not going to do that but this is what the outcome would be so we're already starting from the point of suboptimal outcome. You're going to run out of money in your, in your mid-70s. And he was like, well, we're not going to do that, are we? And I was like, no, 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 we're not. <laughs> we're going to invest it and you're going to get a return. But I'm showing you if you don't invest it. I think it's really, really powerful to start from that. Well, it, cre it creates the baseline, doesn't it? This is, and we've, we've often done that. in play. This, is, kind of, this is where you are right now. And they may well be 100% in cash or they may be in a very, very defensive portfolio. You could say, before we start well, doing anything, it, it, if you're on the track, this is where you're going to end up now. If we, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a demonstration. It's a clear demonstration of the value add that we can bring. But, but, we're, go we're going to give you but, something which is likely to give you better outcomes. But, but, but so, you're basically saying you have no choice. You need to invest this money. 
Not yeah. the other way around. Let's yeah. scare you off the ledge before we've even discussed it. No. Yeah. If you leave this money in cash, there's a, there's, there's a known outcome. If you invest this money, which is going to be volatile, but there's a chance you're going to get over the financial finish line. Currently, you're 25 years under the financial finish line. You need to invest this money. But, but, but we, we've not learned that from any risk profiling companies. We've learned that as professional, client-focused financial planners using financial planning software. They, they, they've not taught us that. <clears throat> Round of applause, Nick. Uh, no, well, I mean, I've got, to, oh, I've got to find that on the hoof now. Let me go. Oh, <laughs> can I, can I just, can I, whilst you're doing that, right, Alan, you mentioned defensive, uh, defensive strategy. Like, that, we, we need to bust that myth because that doesn't, like, what were defensive portfolios? Oh, loads of bonds and maybe a bit of cash and a bit of oh, alternatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've yeah. proven, um, well, sorry, we haven't proven anything. The market has proven over the last, uh, five ten years that they just, don't exist. They don't work. We they need, cost too much. Yeah. They're suboptimal. We need to anyway. call them low return. This is a low return portfolio. It's a medium yeah, return. I like portfolio. that. It's a like high that. return portfolio. You said that before. Would, would you want a high return portfolio or a low return? This one, the high return, which everyone wants, it does come it's with a bit more volatility. That just comes with the yeah. territory. Like you want to get fit. It's not risk. You got to go. You got to go to the yeah. gym. There's just there's a payback for everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're at fifty-five minutes. Just on that point. So Will Smith asked that point. It sounds to me, Will, that you're not you're doing you're putting the the, the cart in front of the horse here. You know, and as 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 Carl alludes, as we all as we will say every episode, because it's a truism and we believe it. The, there's no portfolio without a plan. You do the financial plan that will determine the portfolio. As Andy said, in most cases, low return portfolios are the highest risk. They will see you running out of money. We don't put people into equities because we like scaring the willies out of them. We do it for a reason. Um, the attitude to risk questionnaire is part of the, you, you know, I, I've got one, I've got, an, I've got a hidden page with about three or four questions. I have it on there to weed out the lunatics who say, yeah, I want to beat inflation by 4%. And I don't want any volatility. And I go, okay, nurse, send the next loon in. Um, <laughs> so I would suggest, Will S, that you just refine your client acquisition process. You shouldn't be having, getting to the stage where once they've got the mumbo jumbo questionnaire and it comes back, there are four out of 10, that it's a problem. You should intuit that from the first meeting or so when you're talking to them about their plan and the planning and how you're likely to be in an equity portfolio. And if they start, if they look at you like you're naked, that's the sign then they get them out of the room and bring the next people in because then you, you otherwise you'll always be bashing against these stupid bloody mumbo jumbo questionnaires, which are the bane of our profession. And I, I think there's a tsunami of litigation coming to the designers of these cretinous bits of software because um, it, it, you know, the, what's happened with the bond markets has changed everything on the industrial side. We know all this stuff already. We've done it for years. This is going to change the industrial side, hope, and hopefully for the better. Um, and I had I had two clients last week. I actually got two new clients, believe it or not, and a minor miracle. And Round at the, of applause. At the, end, I, at the end, I give them my hidden page, my attitude to risk questionnaire, and the answers came back exactly as I thought they would do. Nick, we're not, we, we understand. We're not bothered. We want to beat inflation. We're going to accept volatility. We'll look at our valuations once or twice a year. We're not bothered by it. And I cut, that's exactly what I expect to get with all of my clients because I'm rigorous with the onboarding process. They don't get that far down the line if I think they're going to have the willies about having shares. Technical term, my good friends, dear Trappist. I think, listen, that's what, we, we better wrap this up. We've um, quickly go around the culture, the culture corner, I think. That makes kind of sense to me. Okay, I've got one. This is one for you, Carl, because I know you're a big Jordan Peterson fan. I've signed up for his essay, <laughs> essay software, which is a browser-based word processing um, package. It's, as, as Jordan says in a, in a video about this, the, the word processors haven't really changed since WordPerfect in the mid-1980s and Word and Google Docs. What Essay is, is, you get it through your browser. It's a very stripped back word processor, but it helps you organize your ideas and you can simply drag and drop themes and it just helps you build, build. And um, I've, I've, I've paid a one-off fee to have it for life. So that, I, so far I'm liking it. Um, it just, it just, we're all, we're all communicate. We are in this profession. We are arch communicators. The people that communicate are the ones that, that are, are, are the top of the tree. So communications is vital, whether we do it verbally or written. So I'm really working hard to, to, to always hone my writing. So Jordan Peterson's essay, I would suggest it. And there'll be a link to all these in the so-called show notes. Um, and how much did you pay for it? How much did you pay for it? I, I think for the lifetime, it's something like 200 quid. As, it's as interesting how these big ways sort of internet, <laughs> <laughs> celebrities let's call them are um yeah getting involved in a lot of software sam harris does it quite a bit jordan peterson it makes sense doesn't it anyway yeah yeah your one andy was monetizing innovation by george tack is that you say it's like yeah it, there is no e on it it's it's jork I, I think it's pronounced slightly differently anyway and mad haven 
R- Raman Jam. Uh, I, I think it's Sri Lankan Raman, origin. Raman Jam, maybe. Depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's called Monetizing Innovation. Adam, we've spoken about this a few times, reading books yep. on pricing. Yep. I've read a couple of books on pricing. This one is in a different league. Um, yeah, I sort of beat myself up around pricing and I've got a few membership sites. So for me, it's really, really hitting home. He is on the invest like the best podcast yeah he's yeah, on invest patrick like o'shaughnessy the... patrick o'shaughnessy well, yeah. invest like the best podcast he's on that recently. it's good that's decent um yeah. i actually haven't started reading the book but i know it's going to be amazing it's called monetizing innovation where w- what happens is people come up with an idea a startup and they spend nine months on the back end working out how to build this software and what they're going to do and launch it they then spend nine minutes before they're going to launch about the pricing He's like, no, no, the pricing is so important and how then, uh, long story short, he says Steve Jobs was the absolute king of pricing. You know, just by accident, I say by accident, obviously Steve thought a lot, lot long and hard about it, but he probably didn't read any books about it. He just had loads of experience. Uh, you know, so for example, let, there'll be three Macs for sale. One's for 2,000 pounds, one's for like 2,400 and one's for like 3,800. They obviously want you to buy the one in the middle or whatever. I know it's like decoy pricing and loads of other stuff, but this uh, monetizing innovation book is, uh, as I say, I haven't actually read it, but I know it's going to be amazing based on on the podcast. So, uh, and a couple of other people I know that are sort of involved in pricing. Um, yeah. So if you're in the, I don't know, if you're in the fixed fee world, that might be more use to you we should have an, a whole episode one day dedicated to pricing smart pricing within financial yeah. planning businesses that, yeah that sounds like a sounds like a plan um alan you um you've got a couple of things in your your culture yeah. corner recommendations for the trappists indeed uh first one is of all people one of the biggest investment banks in the world jp morgan jp morgan produce every quarter a report which they uh um, what do they call it uh, jp morgan guide, guide to the, to the guide to the markets and it is, you know, it's about 70 odd pages. A lot of it is it's it's US, but a lot of it is kind of not really relevant to us. But there's probably half of it that is, you know, I'm not really a, a, a geek and a sort of a into data and spreadsheets and that, but there's some fantastic stuff in it. I've, I did it, um, I, re- I looked the whole thing and I, on my Twitter account, and that's my current pinned tweet, because I've just sort of share all the relevant slides that are come from the most recent quarterly report. There's some good, really good stuff in it. And it is very, it will support in these current crazy times, it would, it would support the case for being a rational optimist. Some of the data that, that's in it, well worth checking out JP Morgan Guide to the Markets, which is you, free you, and fairly you, accessible. You're not trying to increase your Twitter followers, are you, at the moment or anything? No, I, I, I never look at it, as you know. I, I, see, I see you. I see you've uh, chosen to wear a different jumper today, the one that's got sleeves. And the second one I've got uh, is called Readwise, readwise.io. Now, we, all, all four of us here, I think we consume a lot of stuff, podcasts, books, you know, all, all that. Um, I, I know that you guys are quite big in Audible and listening to books. For whatever reason, we're all made differently. I like to read. I read books on Kindle or the Kindle app on my phone. And what I, when I read them, and I'm, I'm most of them being um, nonfiction, so they're about business or, or whatever, and I highlight bits. I just get on my Kindle, you just highlight a, a, a paragraph or a line or something, well, that's really interesting. And then you, you link your Kindle or whatever digital reader that you use to this app called Readwise, and it uses this, this format of, um, of just r- repetitive learning. So every you, know, you can set it up anytime you want, but every morning about 6 a.m. when I'm having a coffee or something, this thing just lands in my inbox. And it's like, you can do as many as you want. I've got 10 or randomly selected highlights from books I've read in the past. And there's, almost every day you think, oh, yeah, I remember reading that a year ago, two years ago, because it, it helps to internalize some of the knowledge because – the danger is just reading loads of books and then going, yep, next, yep, next. And I haven't really internalized any of the ideas mm. or insights. So it's a nice, seamless kind of setup just to, in your inbox, quick look once a day. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that uh, idea that I thought at the time was brilliant. Therefore, I highlighted it. So I recommend readwise.io. Great stuff. And finally, sorry, Kyle, you had to wait a little while there. Mr. Widget, the human side of money, my friend. Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, Andy, was Brendan Fraser, was I introduced to him at Humans Under Management? Did you have him speaking at Humans Under Management? Yeah, I had him speaking. Yeah, Yeah. he's a good guy. I I couldn't remember, was it? I I, I was nearly sure it was there. Yeah, I I think like his his podcast, The Human Side of Money, 
uh, is really, really good. But he's also got a newsletter. It's really good. Follow him on Twitter. Uh, but that particular episode is a bit of an oldie. And the reason I put it up was, um, obviously, we're getting uh, tweets from, from people who are following our, our own channel and questions via that. But this one is about um, social media for financial advisors. And I think um, it's possibly a topic we should actually uh, have a look at ourselves. And not that we're any great experts, but obviously we have the two boys trying to beat each other on Twitter. So just to, just to explore that game that you're playing. Um, but, but in this particular episode, uh, Brendan interviews Samantha Russell, who is um, a force of nature when it comes to financial advisor marketing in the States. Right. Um, so I, I would highly recommend all of Brendan's stuff if you're not on it already. But if you're into social media marketing for your job as a financial planner, get on this one. Brendan's interview with uh, Samantha Russell. Excellent stuff. Um, wow. Look at that. We 65 minutes have just gone so, so quickly. I think we're going to have to tie it up there. Thank you so much, gents, for your contributions. Thank you, Trappist, for listening and contributing. This is your show as much as ours. I think the next show is going to be around that subject of solopreneur versus growing a practice. So if that's an inter of interest to you, leave a question in the form in the pinned tweet at the top of at advisor podcast do leave a nice review on itunes six out of five ideally do like and subscribe to us on youtube don't have much else to say gents uh see you all soon thanks for another cracking show take care guys thank you thank you very see much you bye thanks bye. nick bye, bye. bye.